Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Paul Ogando. Give me a few more minutes of your attention. Go to John chapter 4. And uh, it's so important, if you saw there in the video, there was, it was me with long hair. No, that's my sister. And so, um, and so my sister is a missionary in the jungle of Peru. Uh, we're actually where my wife was born also and uh, if you haven't read the church blog I'll just give a plug because she shared her story of the mission field and she has a long rich history of missions Her grandparents were missionaries um, as a matter of fact her paternal grandparents planted a church in Moscow in the 50s And so for us to come back to this area. It's an amazing thing. We didn't know Tracy didn't know me and I didn't know her we grew up in two different countries I'm actually from the Dominican Republic. We have a an inside joke where I told the guys I said I love that you say go to all the world yet Dominican Republic was that little socket down there with a the wire coming out, you know, so it's just a little island. Um, but uh, I, I've been called from everything. Pastor Eros swears I'm from Haiti. Pastor Jim asked me, the how's Puerto Rico? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's so interesting because it's, we just from two different worlds, but with the same calling, same attitude, same desire that God has put in our hearts about mission. And I, I'm such a believer of mission, especially short-term missions. You can ask any of our pastors, any of our pastors, and they would tell you their lives have been transformed by short-term missions, starting with our senior pastor, whose testimony is that he went to Kenya, and when he came back, he knew exactly, or Nigeria, one of the two, Nigeria, right? When he came back from Nigeria, he knew exactly that God had called him to be a pastor, not a missionary. Even if you were to define your life that way, that's a great thing, because you know exactly what God has called you to do and that is the transforming power of mission i want to share to you jesus and missions and i know the title doesn't sound very exciting or transformational but everything we do is through the eyes of jesus there's nothing we should do that is outside of the lens of jesus focusing if he pray i want to pray if he share the gospel i want to share the gospel if he fasted i want to fast if he was merciful i want to be merciful if he was forgiving i want to be forgiven because everything we do is through the lens of jesus christ are you with me and so if the person of Jesus himself did and practiced and gave us an amazing illustration of missions and I should desire that connection with missions also and I want to share with you uh, th this important connection because my life was transformed by missions my wife's life was transformed by missions and so we we're called there she was born I think I have a picture do I have a picture um, I don't know if I sent that in time of my wife and her family yeah there she is and so this is, this is in Peru, and it doesn't show the whole house, but they lived in one of those stilt houses with no doors, hammock, I mean, nothing, just a roof and sticks holding it up. And so, and then, so that's her, and she looks just like her mom now. And, uh, and so it just looks like with our kids, except that guy doesn't look like me. I'm a little darker, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> But that's her family. You can take the picture away. But she was born in the jungle of Peru. Her parents made an incredible investment of spending a lot of their life there when things got hard. If you ever heard of, you know, the guerrilla warfare that happened in Peru and um, the carteles and all the stuff that were going on. And so they left the country and they came back to the United States and planted a church in Las Vegas and have worked in missions ever since. And for me, it was the opposite. For me, missionaries came to the Dominican Republic and absolutely impacted my life. As a matter of fact, I went to college because I saw what a missionary did. I met a missionary surgeon, and he would do surgeries for cliff, cliff lip, and palate um, children. And so I saw how much the, their life was changed by a simple surgery. I said, what do I have to do to do that? And so somebody explained it to me, and I embarked on that. I went to high school. I went to college to become an oral surgeon because I wanted to change somebody's life by doing that. God had other plans, and I'm glad he did. And I'm happy to be here and continue to move forward in this way. But there's three things, real quick, that I see Jesus do. In John, in John chapter 4, and I want us to be there. I'm going to run through the story. We're not going to go anywhere. I'm just going to read right through it, and I want you to read with me. But the first thing I want you to know about missions is this. What missions is to an unbeliever. That is the first thing you see in John chapter 4 when Jesus approaches to a woman called the Samaritan woman. Doesn't give us her name, just says she was from a particular town and she had a particular life. And it's the first thing we see is what missions is to an unbeliever. How do they react to it? How do they react to people coming to them? Let's read the story. Jesus says, hey, I have to depart. And he departs a place and starts going that way. Starts in verse 3, said, he left Judea, departed again to Galilee. Verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. I want you to notice the three towns mentioned here and in order. Because those three towns were the same words Jesus used in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is literally practicing the prophecy he's about to tell them later on. He said, I'm leaving Judea, I'm going to Galilee, but I must pass through Samaria. I'm going to show you what I'm going to ask you to do pretty soon. So that's really important that you notice. See, when, for people like us, for pastors, we've studied the Word so much. When we go to a familiar story, we already have an enormous amount of information about the story. So I asked, Lord, Lord, I already know this story. How can you break this down for me for us to understand it separately than just he reached out to a woman at the well and was merciful to her? Are you with me? That's the story we all know. There's something about missions hidden here that is absolutely powerful, starting with the fact that Jesus modeled Acts 1.8. He said, we're going here, and we're going to go through three places that I'm going to let you know later on in life. Verse 5, so he came to the Syria Samaria, which is called Sikar, and he came to a plot of ground. That Jacob is given to his son Joseph. Very important. This is traditional. We're not going to go there in detail. Verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary, being tired from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. And that's about noon, according to historians. That's about noon. So most of the time, noon in the desert is pretty much what? Hot. And we all experience it here. And we at least have some trees around here. So it's pretty hot. So Jesus engages a woman that's at the well. Which is not common. Most people, if you're in small town and hot towns, you go early in the morning when it's cool, you do what you got to do, and then you hide away. My wife and I lived in Las Vegas. There is nobody outside between noon and five. You know, when I first moved to Las Vegas, I didn't know any of this. I've never lived in the desert, and I love playing basketball. So I'm out there at four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, shooting hoops. Within 10 minutes, my shoes were melting. Mel and I was like, what in the world? So I just ran. I mean, I burned my toes. It was ridiculous. So I had to learn that you go about eight o'clock at night to play. So it was the same thing here. These people were like, you know what? You just don't go at that hour. So here's what happened. Verse seven, the women of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, very important, give me a drink. Man, that sounds like a simple request. Give me a drink. But Jesus is not asking a simple request. He's trying to get to a point because in the previous verse, it says, I must go through Samaria. Jesus is trying to teach us and his disciples a very important lesson about missions. And the conversation goes, give me a drink. That sounds like a reasonable request. He's thirsty. He's tired. Verse number eight. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. How interesting. He stayed by himself. I think Jesus purposely orchestrated that. Somebody always wants to say, hey, can I stay behind? I'll help the master out. You know, no, Rabbi, don't stay by yourself. Pretty much say, hey, guys, go on up. Go get food. I'm working on something. I'm working on something. So I want you to travel with me to what Jesus is working on. Verse number nine, the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me? I am a Samaritan woman. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This is so important to the whole story because Jesus is driving. Remember the story of the good Samaritan? This is the reason why Jesus did that story. It's to shock their system. It's to make them understand that they're, even though Samaritans were hated people by the Jews and the religious Jews because they were half-breed. They were people who mixed with others and they kind of started their own kind of God religion because they wouldn't let them go to Jerusalem. So they were hated even though they kind of came from the same process. But they mixed with other nations. So they, they didn't like them. They were hated people. And this is so important because Jesus is making a point to you and I about mission that we got to reach people we're uncomfortable with. We got to reach people we're uncomfortable with. And when we talk about, uh, man, I, I'm going to be real because we're a real church, so let me be real with you. When we're talking about missions in the south of the border, I don't really care your immigration status. I just want you to get to heaven with me. That's my job. That's, that's all I do. And I'm going to be upfront about it because, because this, is, this is the driving factor. I'm not saying violate the law. I'm not saying don't obey the law of the land. I'm saying my priority is that your soul is saved. Jesus is saying, I do not care that you're from Samaria, lady. I'm asking you for water because I want to teach you something. And she's saying, you're weird, dude. You're a man. Number one, men and women don't talk. And those times you're approaching me. And on top of that, I'm from a town you don't like. I think that's a problem. <laughs> You know, but Jesus is trying to lead us to something. Here's the point Jesus wanted with that question. Jesus says, or is leading to this, I am going to use what you have to show you what you actually need. I'm going to use what you have to show you what you actually need. 
See, Jesus says, give me water. And she's saying, well, why, why are you asking this of me? You and I are not supposed to have a conversation. And look, look what happens. Verse 10, verse 10 says, Jesus answered to her, if you knew the gift of God and who is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus did not question. Jesus just said, listen, I got something for you. You don't even know you need it, but I asked you the question because I know you do need it. And when we have conversations with non-Christians, you got to look, you got to be paying attention for those clues. We actually have a neighbor that my wife is ministering to, and this man is rough around the edges, has had a rough life. He's a, he was a tough neighbor, and hopefully not watching online because then I'm going to get in trouble. But, um, but if you are even here, forgive me. Um, but we do love you. So he, you know, smokes all the time and is, you know, just, he's a tough guy. You know, he's a tough guy. But lately his life fell apart. Wife left him. Kids don't want to be with him. He's selling his house. And all of a sudden, the window of give me a drink was open. You don't have to ask my wife a whole lot. She'll jump through the window and tell you. So, <laughs> so she did. You know, she just reached out to you have to get to church, man. You have to come to church with us, and you have to go. Yeah, my brother is. He's. he's I'm going to the, the high desert. My brother lives there. And he's going to a church. They're good. You got to get. My wife was just on it. Get to church. Get to church. Why? There was a window open. He said, "Give me a drink," and she said, "Yeah, I'll show you where it's at." And and that's really the conversation. So when you look for clues, people who are not in Christ, they'll give you. They'll. They're just handed it over to you, and they say, "Here's where I'm at." There's just one thing I love about non-Christians. Sometimes is they're honest. We Christians hide our issues sometimes. Oh, blessed of the Lord. Amen, brother. I'm just wrong. <laughs> Man, I'm in trouble now. I better end this thing. So he has a conversation and explains to her, hey, listen, this is what's going on. Um, you know, give you the drink. And so she said, I'm going to skip a few verses for time's sake. But basically she says, listen. You know, how can you give me a better water than this well can? Our fathers built this well. Once again, she's leaning towards the natural when Jesus is talking about something supernatural. And somebody who doesn't know Christ, that's their level of understanding. They're saying, this is better. How can you give me something better? And guys, when we talk about missions, this is really important. Understanding that what we offer, it is better. But you cannot just drive it and say it's better. Jesus does it in an amazing way. He says, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Hey, man, if you think that your answer is a divorce, believe me, you'll probably get divorced again. How about if I show you that Jesus may have an answer for your actual situation now? Verse 14, whosoever drinks of this water shall say, get, never thirst anymore, he says, but the water that I shall give him, I will thirst, sorry, but the water that I shall give him, he will become in him, it will become in him a fountain of water, the spring of forever lasting life. And she says, and the woman said, verse 16, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst or come near here to draw. She said, I want a solution for my situation. So when we looked at missions, this is what missions looks like. There's a desire of people to know how to, how to quench their thirst, how to understand where they're at in life. But you got to you got to be looking for those clues. Are you with me? you got to be opening a window. The conversation gets even deeper and interesting. Jesus said to her, verse 16, go call your husband and come here. We actually were having a, a training today, and it was a very good training on how to serve people better. And this is a question that is so, like, in your face, you know. And now today people are polite. We're trying to be polite because, you know, we get offended. But sometimes when the window is open, it's time to just shoot. I, I've seen Pastor Jim do that so many times. Somebody opens a window and he just shoots and see where it goes. And so I've just seen him do it so many times. I'm like, man, he's so bold. I'm, I'm not there yet. You know, I'm like, hey, I'm going through this. Oh, man, let me pray for you. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, but he, he just goes at it. Jesus was the same way. It's like, hey, you open the window. I'm going to let you know, lady. So he says, hey, listen, call your husband and let's talk. Come here. And then she said, the woman and answer, well, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have well, you have well said. He said, that's the right, that's the truth. I have no husband for you have, we talk about prophecy there, for you have had five husbands and the one who you now have is not your husband in that you spoke truly. So Jesus gives through the gift of prophecy, just lets her know this is where you're at. And she said, well, sir, I perceive your prophet. You think? I mean, he just <laughs> told you where you're at. Verse 20, here's how, how interesting how missions looks to other people. Look how she switches the topic. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. Wait a minute. He just told you you're sleeping around and you go, our fathers worship somewhere else. <laughs> Is that weird? 
It was weird when I saw it. I was like, wait a minute, lady, <laughs> where are you going? I'm asking you to do something. I'm challenging you somewhere. And you turn it spiritual because people are going to talk about what they know in the capacity where they're at. Next verse, verse 21. Verse 21 says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour's coming, and this is so important for us, when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You know what Jesus says? Listen, lady, I don't care if you're a Samaritan or if you're a Jew. There's going to be a time where God is just looking for real people regardless of where they're at. Doesn't matter. Why? Because it says, because verse 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus it has nothing to do with where you're at, not Samaria, not in Jerusalem, until the ends of the earth. It does not matter. When we go to Mexico, Rosarito, we want to worship with them, and we worship in the same God. When you go to unreached people groups, they want to know what God you actually worship. There's something very real about that. Here's number two. Here's number two. And these are short, real concise. If you give me five more minutes of your time. Number two is what missions this to us. So Jesus turns around and starts challenging us and says, hey, you have to make a difference. You have to make a change. But Jesus uses this moment to show his disciples something. What happens is the lady gets, you know, impressed with what Jesus is doing. She puts the pot of water down and runs into town and starts telling everybody, hey, come, come with me. Let's go to the well because there's a man there that's told me everything I've done in my life. And so people are like, wow, that's a long list because I know you later. So, <laughs> so, so everybody starts running out of town. Let's go with this lady. I mean, it's got to be amazing, you know. So they land there, and in the meantime, while that's happening in town, Jesus is talking to his disciples. In the meantime, his disciples urge him, saying, Rabbi, eat, because they went to town to get food. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. How interesting. Here's, here, this is going to be important. I have food you don't know. And they're saying, has anyone brought them food or anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And he says, you know, you say that there's four months until the harvest come. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. He's saying people are ready. They're going through stuff and they want to hear what you have to say. Say, lift up your eyes and look for the opportunity. Are you with me? Look for the chance. But he puts it in a way that's very important. This is what's interesting for you and I, is that you and I have to focus on the opportunity and what God is doing missions for us. Here's what missions should be for us, that doing the will of the Father should be the one thing that fully satisfies us. Doing the will of the Father should be the one thing that fully satisfies us. I could have been a good surgeon, but I would never be satisfied because God had a different plan for my life. You could be a great mechanic, but if God's will is a different for you, you have to go get that. And it has nothing to do with being happy, because that's another thing, that's another craziness around Christianity today, that to serve God, it has to be happy. Let me just, uh, let me just tell this story. A missionary in Africa once asked if they really liked what he was doing. His response was shocking. He said, do I like this work? He said, no, my wife and I do not like dirt. We have reasonable, refined responsibilities and sensibilities. We do not like crawling in vile huts through goat, through goat um, refuse. Uh, that means poo-poo for those uh, <laughs> through goat stuff. But is a man to do nothing with Christ that he does not like? God pity him. If not, liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. God told us to go, so we go. And that big go is the main thing. He said go, so we do it. Whether we like it or not, it has nothing to do with our comfort. It has everything to do with what it's asked us to do. Last point for tonight, and I want to end with this. What missions affects, how missions affects others. And this is so important because we're seeing the effect of missions right now in Rosarito and as we're working. Listen, I, I want to say something that is one of the focuses we're changing is we're not focusing on giving food away, even though we bring food and food is important. And we have a tremendous food distribution center. We feed, uh, I don't know, half a million people in this area. And this is really, 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 really important that you understand. It's so, so crucial. Remember what Tracy just said, that the, the little girl had an iPad and nice shoes? She doesn't need the food. She needs Christ. She needs hope. 
She needs a strong and solid church that will lead them through whatever situation they're going through. And that's what God is asking us to do in this town to move things forward as we invest in missions. It's that we build, if the desire of Pastor Jim and Deborah they were here is this, because they've shared with me, I want to build a solid church. Because if there's a solid church in the town, there'll be a place for people to go and get fed and get distributed and grow and make it a heaven. And that's very, very important. I'll end with this. How missions, how others are affected by missions. Then the story ends this way. The lady brings a bunch of people, and this is what they say. And a lot of Samaritans in that town, I'm looking at the contemporary English version, says a lot of Samaritans in that town put their faith in Jesus because the woman had said. This is so important, very important. This man told me everything I've ever done. The first thing people do is they see the God in you before they put the trust in God. It's so crucial, so crucial. We live in our street, and everybody knows I'm a pastor. So everything I do gets looked at from that perspective. Imagine that, how I raise my kids. You know, if I'm looking down the street, they're playing, hey, get off of the street. There goes the pastor yelling at his kids. Well, I don't want the kid to get run over, you know, but whatever. You get judged for everything, you know. Um, so, but Jesus is saying, listen, the lady's saying, so many people believe. Verse 40, they came and asked him to stay um, in their town, and he stayed a couple more days. Verse 41, now look at the difference. Many more Samaritans put their faith in Jesus because of what they what? From who? From him. Starts with you, you lead them to him, and he'll take care of it from there. Starts with you, you lead them to him, and he'll take care of it from there. And that's so crucial. And I'll end with this. And they told the woman, we no longer have faith in Jesus just because of what you told us. We have heard him ourselves, and we are certain that he's the savior of the world. And that is transformational mission. That is exactly what the Lord wants for us. And so as we end tonight, as we end tonight, I want to pray together before I hand it over. And we do announcements. I'll hand it over to Pastor Dan in a moment. But I want us to pray together. And I want us to do something that was a verse that transformed my life when I was a teenager. I was 16 years old, and I heard the verse and I heard the call of God upon my life for missions. And it's Psalm 2.8. And Psalm 2.8 says the following. Psalm 2.8 says, the, ver- the Amplified Version says, As for me, ask of me, sorry, and I will give you nations as your inheritance and the, order- and the uttermost parts of the earth as your possession. And another version says, Ask of me the nations for the nations and every nation on the earth will belong to you. And this is so crucial. My wife and I wanted to go on the mission field and travel and do this because it's more exciting to do that. But you know what's interesting? We've always wanted to be in Latin America because I believe God asked me, God asked me, what do you want to do? And I told God this, I want to be effective. He asked me, do you want to be popular or effective? And I said, I want to be effective because effective people accomplish more. I already know Spanish, so I wanted to do that. Guess what? In La Roca, we probably have about close to 10 different nations represented every single weekend. I'm not on a plane. I'm right here. They're right at our doorstep from Mexico to Nicaragua to Honduras, Guatemala, um, El Salvador, some Ecuadorians, a few Argentinians, some Puerto Rican, a couple Dominicans spread here, a couple Cubans here and there. Um, what else? They're all there. They're all there. Why? Because we're reaching out to them for the nations. Can you pray with me real quick as we end? Let's pray together. Father God, we're just asking and believing what you say in your word, to ask you for the nations, Father. And as we end this service tonight, I am asking you that you absolutely bring a transformation, uh, Father, in the nations. Not just missions globally, Lord, but we ask in our own backyard. There's people from Indonesia. There's people from Thailand. There's a great community in every area, Father. Help us reach as many groups and languages as there are around us, Father God. As many countries as they come to La Roca and are represented here in our main camp us also that our English speakers. Lord, give us the nation. You said to ask, so we ask it today, Father. Send laborers. That was your, what you told the disciples, so we pray today. Send laborers, Father, to reach out to the harvest, starting with our neighborhood, moving on through our work, our jobs, everything we do, our families, Father God, and all over the world. I ask for that. And if anybody has a missions desire here, Lord, give them the tools and empower them to do what you've called them to do starting today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. Give a hand to God if he spoke to you today. Would you let me do something real quick? I really feel from the spirit this and I, and I would ask your patience. Jesus says that he would leave the 99 for the one and I believe that there's a one right now. And, uh, and, 
And if you're here tonight, you need to know something. I don't want to wait till the end. I want you to check your own heart this moment. We've worshiped God. I know you felt the Holy Spirit. I know you felt God today in this place. And you're asking yourself, what, what is this all about? Where's my life? How come they're feeling something I'm not necessarily connected to? Where God wants to change that. And he wants to change that right now. This is a question we always ask. If today were to be your last day, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And most people will answer it. Pastor, I am going to heaven. Because most people, and I will share some data later talking about missions, most people assume because they're born in a Christian country or their family says they're Christian or their family says they believe in God or have an understanding of God, then that automatically gives them access to heaven. Nothing can be further from the truth, and I do not want to let you make a wrong decision tonight. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have anything to do with me. God doesn't want you to make a wrong decision tonight. He sent his only son to reach to you so that you can give him an opportunity to transform and work in your life. This is your opportunity. If you've ever said, well, pastor, you know, yeah, I mean, heaven, I'm going to go there. There's nothing here that says because you think you can, that you will. It's not written. There's nowhere on these pages, the word of God, his words that says, because you've been to church or you visit a church here and there or you lifted a prayer or on your way to work one day, you remember God that you would make it. There, there's no evidence of that here. There's only one thing. And Jesus says, I am, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no man, no man, he leaves no room for error. No man comes to the father except through me. So that's the opportunity he's presenting to you today. He's saying, if you want to change life, give me a chance. If you want a transformation in your life, give me a chance. And I want to ask you tonight, if you would open your heart to Jesus, if you would open your heart to God this day so that you are in heaven with him when your day comes, that's the opportunity presented to you tonight. See, these guys are worshiping God. We're all singing. The presence of God is so thick in this place. But you are feeling, (laughs) how do I connect with that? Then this is your opportunity. God is asking you to give him a chance. I'm gonna count to three, I'm gonna hit this Bible, and you're gonna raise your hand. When you raise your hand, then I'm gonna ask you to personally, I wanna pray with you here. Pastor, that sounds embarrassing. Don't be embarrassed. We're not trying to embarrass you. We're trying to give you an opportunity, but the devil wants to make you think that if you take this step or you do this, that somehow people, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? No, do not trade an eternity with God because you were embarrassed for a moment to raise your hands. As a matter of fact, he says in the book of Luke, he says, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my father. But if you deny me, (laughs) that's not for me. He says, I will deny you. It's not his desire. He wants you, he wants you to be with him, but you have to decide for him. Who should raise their hand in this place? You know God spoke to you. When I count to three, you raise your hand. Who should raise your hand and pray with us today? If you know tonight that if you were to die today, it will be your last day on earth, that you will not make it to heaven, then change your position today. Who should raise your hand? You know God spoke to you today, and you know you're not walking with God. You're half there. You're here. You're there, but you're not truly committed to God. He's saying, I want to give you an opportunity today. Remember, Jesus left the 99 for the one. I don't know how many there are, but I know you're there because he spoke to me. I'll count to three. You raise your hands, and then we'll pray together. One, two, and three. Is there anybody in this place? This is your moment. Thank you. See a hand over there. Two, thank you. Three, thank you. Four, thank you. See anyone else? This is your moment. Thank you. I see your hand. You can lower your hand. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Five, six. You can, once I see you, you can put it down. This is your moment. You just say, you know what? I'm going to stop playing with God. I'm going to get serious with God right now. This is your chance to do it. God, thank you for those who are standing, all of you guys. Pray for, thank you. Thank you. It's seven. You can lower your hand. I see that hand. Just get serious with God. Just say, Lord, you know what? I'm not going to play church anymore. I'm not going to play. Do I know you're not? This is your moment. This is your moment to honestly be truly honest with God. Thank you. I see that hand. You're in church. You're in the presence of God. At least be honest in your own heart and say, okay, this is the real deal or it's not. And that's what God is asking you to do. Is there anyone else in this place? I'm waiting because I believe the Holy Spirit is asking me to wait. Thank you. Is there another hand? I see in a family room. That's awesome. Go ahead and decide. Do that. We're working hard for you right now. I wish you would have done it all at once. 
but it's okay. I'm waiting because what I believe God has told me is far more than what I see today. And I am asking you today, God is asking you today, this is your moment. As a matter of fact, I share something I always share because I believe that some of you are in that category. Listen to this. I was 12 years old. I was in a church much more than this. Everybody knew who I was. My mother was a CFO of a very tiny church, so call it, if you can call it that. Um, she was one of the founders of the church. And I remember I was 12 years old and a pastor preached and he has the same call. He said, hey, if you want to give your life to Jesus, your moment. And I remember, even though I've been to church all my life, at that moment I said, I cannot hide anymore. I knew I wasn't right in my heart, even though I've been to church every Sunday and my mother was one of the leaders in the church. I raised my hand and I've never regretted it. I have never regretted it because if I would have died that moment, I was not going to be with God, even though I was up perfect attendance boy at church that's you you know it god is asking you to change your position if that's you today just raise your hands and let me know pastor i want to change my position with god today is there anyone else this is your moment we're going to pray in a little bit but i'm just giving you an opportunity in god can we worship once again there's a lot of spiritual warfare right now. And I'm going to tell you why. Because God spoke to me. Aside from the nine that I just saw, there's ten more. Ten. I mean, most of you guys are raising your hand and worshiping God. But I just believe that. If I look like a fool, then hey, so be it. Our pastor had taught us that. So I'm okay with that. And I want to believe for you. Can you guys sing Holy, Holy once again? And if they sing it, you check your heart. And in a moment, we'll pray together. your hand I'm going to ask you to meet me right here right now that you take a step of faith you say pastor that's what I want and so I want you to get out of your seat whatever you at. come down the aisle meet me right now now in a moment if you did not raise your hand but you know you have to raise your hand I want you to make, take that step also but before we all take that step I'll ask it one more time by the spirit of God if you have not raised your hand this is your moment is there anyone else in this place that says that's me I got to change my position with God this is your moment just raise your hand right where you're at and say pastor I want to do that I need that today. Thank you. Thank you. See a brave one. Is there anyone else? This is your moment to say, you know what? I'm not going to play with God anymore. Thanks. Thank you. God is good. Here's what I'll do. Those hands that were raised. I'm going to ask you that you step out of the aisle. You come right here. Meet me right here. We're going to pray. Now, listen, if you did not raise your hand, this is your moment. When they're walking, you say, man, I'm going to join that group, and I'm going to come down because I need to get my life right with God starting tonight. If you can do that, come join us right now. Let's welcome these guys. Take a step of faith. Take the Holy Holy. We want to pray with you. Open your heart today. Let them out. Let them out of the seat. Somebody to come with you, just tell them, hey, come with me. Can you come with me? I want to give my heart to Christ. Come with me. Thank you. Thank you. Come with me. Just nudge somebody and say, I, I want to get there. I, I got to do that prayer tonight. Just ask for a transformed life this hour. This is a brave step. We'll wait for you. If you're here tonight, don't, don't wait any longer. Say, I gotta do this. This is my turn. This is my chance. Thank you. We'll wait for you. Thank you, guys. God is so good. Awesome. Thank you, guys. In a moment, you guys don't need to back. In a moment, we're all gonna pray and we're gonna ask Jesus to come into your heart. This, it's a simple prayer. I love praying with people in a moment. Pastor Joe will explain some things, but I want to pray. I want this whole congregation wants to pray with you. Is that okay if we do that? So you're just going to invite Jesus in your heart. 
you're saying yes to God before you say yes to the church. Now, we want you to say yes to us because we want to help you stay on with God. And you'll explain how you do that. But in a moment, we're all going to pray. But I'm going to ask your patience because I believe the Spirit just spoke to me. There's five more of you. And as I talk to them, if you're one of those, if you said, man, I skated, I, you have to make your way down here because God is reaching out to you. God is reaching out to you. He's not letting you get away with well, God, I've done a prayer, I've seen a Bible, I've heard about you. He's saying, no, take me serious. Take me at my word. All of us have at some point to God as his word and said, God, I want what you have and I'm gonna take it serious. And that is the call of God for you today. No gimmicks, no show, no prices. You get serious with God, he gets serious with you. That's the call of God. He loves you enough to say, come on, man, get out of this. Get serious with me. I got something for you. If you're that one, just come on down. And in a moment, we're going to pray together. This is your moment. Can you sing holy, holy again? Don't be embarrassed to say, you know what? I'm, I'm making the move. I'm getting out there. I'm going to take a step of faith in God. Thank you. I'm going to take a step of faith in God. That's, that's your call. It's your moment. We're not going to force you to do it. I'm going to talk to them. If you still, this is your moment. God is tugging at my heart. He's tugging at yours. Get yourself down here. Listen, we're going to pray in a moment, all of us up here. This is going to be a good moment. You put a smile on your face, I, on your face. I know you're probably sad and crying. That's called repentance. You're saying, God, I want to change. And that's okay too. Those tears bring transformation. But when you pray, it's not some magical words that we say. It's the honesty of your heart that God sees. That's what he's written in his word in the book of Romans. So we're going to repeat it. And you're going to be honest with your heart. And you'll see that honesty. In that moment, new life begins. Let's all pray with them to invite Jesus. Say, dear Lord, dear Lord I invite you into my heart. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins, the wrongdoings I've committed against you and others. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior to be with you from this day and until eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Awesome. This is what we're going to do. Pastor Joel, who's over there, one of our leaders, he's going to go with you. We have a new believer's room. He's going to give you material. Nothing weird happens. He'll pray again with you if you need more prayer. He'll offer you an SBT. What's that? A person that can help you to get strong in God and continue. This prayer is just the first step. We want to help you take many of those along the years. And so that's how it starts. If you give him a chance, he'll explain that. And then he'll let you back into the service where you hear and learn more a little bit what the Bible says about missions. So if you would turn my right, your left, and follow him, and then you'll come right back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Come on, give him a big, big ovation. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin. And I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. 
Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.